I want to read this text to you. It's going to be the second text in my sermon, um, <clears throat> Zach. And uh, Zach is, uh, as you know, he's just recently been trained. I am putting him through the hoops. I'm trying to make him jump as high as he can. And this guy just keeps surprising me. I went up the back today and I said, okay, the video we're going to show needs to, and I'm looking for the spot to show him where. And he goes, over here? I said, dude, you're just too much. <laughs> All right. I want to read from Acts chapter 2, verse 14 to 18. And then 38 to 39. This is the day of Pentecost. Peter gets up to speak to the crowd that had assembled. 3,000 people got saved on that day. But Peter, standing up with the 11, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose. You know, we go to church and we think everything has to be super orderly. Funerals are orderly. Nurseries aren't orderly. And there is a degree where we could be so orderly that we don't have any room for the Holy Spirit. And we don't want to be that type of people. Now, I know that Paul in Corinthians talks about spiritual order in the church. But let me draw your memory to the passage that Pastor Steve read earlier. Religious people get in a religious funk. And when the people of Jesus' day got excited and started to shout and make noise and wave palm leaves, the religious men of that day said, that's too fanatical. Let's keep things in context and be real when we read the word of God. And we have exercised excitement and fanaticism so far out of the church that the church is barely breathing. That was quiet. And Jesus said, if they don't praise me, the rocks will praise me. That means Jesus, he was encouraging the enthusiasm. He was encouraging the enthusiasm. Look what Peter says here. These folk aren't drunk as you suppose. On the day of Pentecost, a violent rushing wind came through the upper room. Tongues of fire appeared on people's heads. And they started speaking in tongues unknown to themselves. Because the religious holiday was Pentecost, Jewish converts and believers from around the nations had converged on Jerusalem. And they are hearing these people talk in tongues and they're recognizing their native language. And they said, these people are praising God in our language. How, how can that be? These are Hebrews. But something so different was happening that the crowd actually thought they were drunk. I want to tell you that drunk people don't learn and start communicating in an educated language. Sometimes when the Holy Spirit comes, and this is historical record all throughout history, and I'll give you just a few today. God does things that are supernatural. Amen. Amen. As you read through the book of Acts, you'll see it often says, and it uses these two words together, and the disciples or the apostles perform signs and wonders. Some things are a sign and it's easily discernible. This is God. Other things are wonders and they make you scratch your head and say, I've never seen this before. God does signs and wonders. And wonders are designed to cause the inquisitive heart to rethink their stagnant position and realize that God is on the move. A church without signs and wonders is a church 
that needs a fresh revival of the Holy Spirit. Can I get an agreement? Amen. Absolutely. The Gospels are the Gospels because they're filled with stories of Jesus walking and performing the acts of God. Jesus made it clear these signs will follow those that believe. He didn't say these signs will follow the apostles. He said these signs will follow those who believe. The testimonies I shared with you, it's not because the great Rob Scarallo prayed. We have a whole church of people praying. Uh, By the way, have I said today, I want you to see Pastor Carlos after the service and sign up and get on the prayer list? Listen, if you want to make history, we sing a song, History Makers. I want to be a history maker. Be part of the praying church of grace and faith. Get on that prayer list. We have seen untold miracles, literally people that the doctors have said they're going to die within a day. My own granddaughter, they said she's got five minutes left to live uh, after she was born, the day after. Miracles are common occurrences for God. Absolutely. Some theologians say, well, they happened in the early church because God was trying to kickstart the church. Oh, really? So he's just a promotionalist, and healings and miracles were never because his heart breaks at the condition of humanity. Is that what we're honestly going to conclude? God forbid that's blasphemous. We want to be so rational in our thinking that we leave no room for the supernatural. I'm going to say that again because that was good. We want to be so rational in our thinking that we leave no room for the supernatural. Absolutely. If everything was meant to be rational, then we need to go through the book of Acts and every time it says signs and wonders and miracles because miraculous things by definition are things that override the laws of the natural. And if we want to be so rational in our religion, in our faith in Christ, then we need to cross out every time it says signs, wonders, and miracles. God doesn't limit himself to the rational, natural mind. He raises the natural mind to his level so that we will experience his supernatural goodness. Can I get an amen? Absolutely. Right up the back, there's Galen, a man who got a miracle, was on his deathbed with COVID. He thought for sure he would die. He texted me, he rang me, we started to pray, and almost immediately changes started to take place in his body. Galen, stand up, and if I'm a liar, tell this church I'm a liar. Did he call me a liar? I couldn't hear him. (laughs) Praise God. Peter says, these are not drunk. Why would he even say that? Why was the crowd saying they must be drunk? If everything was so orderly and so precise. They were praying in languages they had not learned. That doesn't make somebody say they're drunk. When you see a drunk man, they're stumbling. When you see a drunk man, they can barely stand. When you see a drunk man, you hear loudness. They said, these men are drunk. And Peter said, no, they're not drunk. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, this is the history of the early church. And God wasn't too concerned about every letter of the alphabet being in its exact order. Tongues on fire appeared in a visionary form on their heads. A violent rushing wind blew through the upper room. People started praying in tongues they had never learned before, and outsiders heard it. God put on a spectacle so that outsiders would wonder, and so that it would be a sign. And in the midst of it, Peter gets up and he preaches a word that points them to Jesus Christ, and 3,000 get saved. When Jesus walked on the earth, he gave authority and power to his disciples. He said, go to every house in this town, knock on the doors, and tell them that the kingdom of God has come, and then prove it by laying hands on the sick. 
and let them see the power of God. Signs and wonders are a sign that Jesus is the Messiah. And this was a, a technique or a method or a pattern that Jesus used to advance the kingdom of God. It's a pattern that God uses yet again today. And too much of the church wants to be rationalistic. I don't want a God that fits neatly into my intellect. I want a God that's bigger and better than anything I can imagine. Can I get an agreement? I serve a Christ that raises the dead. The same spirit that raised him from the dead lives in us. That's what the Bible says. The power of resurrection is in us. And if you've never heard preaching like this before, I apologize. Not that I'm preaching like this. I apologize that no one's ever told you this. <laughs> For these are not drunk as you suppose since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Are we living in the last days? Am I in grace and faith, church? How many of you believe we're living in the last days? You know what the last days are? When you study that word in the Greek, the New Testament was written in Greek. It says the last age, the last time period. There are time periods where God did certain types of things. From Adam to Noah. It was a dispensation, a time period. From Abraham to Jesus. It was a time period up until... up. Before Jesus, a time period called the law. And God dealt with the nation of Israel and tried to bring the good news to the world through them. And from the time of Christ, his crucifixion and resurrection, this is the year of God's favor. The Bible uses that term. There is at the end of this age, at the end of this time period called the year of God's favor. Today is the day of salvation. Paul says, the next time period is called the day of God's wrath. It's a day instead of a year. It's a short period and judgment is coming on the earth. And I believe the church will have been raptured and then we slip right into the millennium. The millennium's another whole time period. And so when, when Jesus said, when Joel said, when Paul said in the last days, he didn't, it, in the Greek, it's not saying 50 years before Jesus returns. The last days in the Greek is literally the last time period before the next. It's an eon. It's a, it's a period of space of time. Well, we are living in that last age before God's judgment comes on the whole earth and he takes us into the millennium. The millennium is going to be a whole new scenario. The Bible says Satan and all of his demons will be bound in hell for 1,000 years. Wow, that's going to be pretty awesome, don't you think? But that's a different era. It's a different time period. We haven't gotten there yet. It's coming. It's really not that far away. But we are still in the age of the church. We are still in the year of God's favor. This is the time period of God's salvation and a time where God wants to reveal himself to humanity. And so the prophet Joel says, in the last days... He's speaking on God's behalf, and it'll come to pass in the last days, said God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Too many people say, well, this stuff isn't for the church today. Why not? We're in the last days. You're meant to prophesy. Oh, no, prophecy will cease. No, when we see perfection face to face, when you read that scripture in context, when we are face to face with Jesus in heaven, we won't need to know the future because we'll have all knowledge. We won't need miracles or healings because we'll be in the presence of everlasting life and health. Can I get an agreement? 
And so the prophet Joel says, in the last days, God's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh, and sons and daughters will prophesy, young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams, and on my maidservants, and on and on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off. This promise What's happening today, Peter's saying. What the prophet Joel is talking about, it's happened. And it's going to continue to happen to all those who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. How many of you here are born again? Raise your hands. And God called you, and this promise is for you. God forbid, God forbid, when well-meaning preachers turn around and call this demonic and say that that doesn't happen anymore. God forbid the word of God says, and this promise will follow you for as many as the Lord will call. Amen. You see, <clears throat> church history, we had a reformation because after Christianity was accepted and the Roman Empire fell, Christianity started to become diluted under crisis and persecution. The faith of the saints remained red hot. But when they got comfortable, when the status quo was okay, Christianity started to get diluted and mixed with paganism. And so over the, the centuries, many truths of the faith were lost. That's why people like Wycliffe, started to write the Bible in common English so that the average person could have access to scriptures and compare it to what they been, had been being taught in the established church, the Catholic church. And that's why people like Martin Luther started to print his theses and started to show that the Bible says we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. And there are so many doctrines of truths that were lost to the church that had to be revived. You see, the church went into such dark ages that over the years, God had to restore truth back to the church. And some say that, you know, what happened on the day of Pentecost has never happened again until Asusu Street. And that's one of the revivals I'm going to talk to you about today very quickly. But I want to tell you that's not correct. Historically, there are records of people having been baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in words, with words of knowledge, prophesying, praying in tongues all throughout history ever since the early church up until today. In fact, even Martin Luther, who was the head of that, the, his uh, a reformation that he initiated, the man who got the revelation that we're justified by faith in uh, one of his books, A Sermon on Keeping Children in School, Martin Luther writes, each justified believer might expect to receive one of several other gifts of the Holy Spirit. He spoke about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and said it's normal for Christians to expect to receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In, the six, in 1685 to 1705 in France, the king of France, uh, King Louis XIV, tried to force every person in his nation to convert to Catholicism. And they did it by force. And they'd go house to house and there was another reformer, uh, and his followers were named after him. They were called the Huguenots. And uh, they had become part of this Protestant Reformation. And King Louis 
would send his guards out into their homes and threaten to confiscate their land and all of their belongings. And many of them were martyred because they would not give up on their newfound faith that they are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And amongst them, there was a group of people known as the Camisards. Camisards. And they were French folk. They lived in a remote region of France, up in the mountains, very remote. And uh, that area was called Seven. And these people, we have historical records that during this persecution, they cried out to God. And many of them started to speak in tongues. Now, the Camisards were illiterate, and they were poor people. And they lived in the... Uh, 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 like I said, these remote hilltop regions, and they actually spoke uh, a language other than French. It was much closer to Spanish, and the language was called Occident. And uh, they did not know how to speak French, though they were in France, the territory of France. And we have records over and over again that as the Holy Spirit came upon them, these unlearned peasants would speak in perfect French fluently. And they would prophesy in perfect French. And so uh, it says here, they could not speak French as their native tongue. They spoke a language called Ossetan that at least in the 1700s had a closer affinity to Spanish. The majority of Camisards were illiterate, uneducated, yet under the power of the Holy Spirit, they spoke in perfect French. Jean Venet explained about his mother and sisters who spoke in tongues and prophesied. I left Montpellier around May 1702. The first people I saw in inspiration, that's how he termed when they would be under the power of the Holy Ghost. The first people I saw in inspiration were my mother, my brother, my two sisters, and a cousin, Germain. My mother's greatest agitations were of the chest, which made her produce great tears. She spoke nothing but French during the inspiration while the Holy Spirit was on her, uh, which gave me a great surprise the first time I heard her because she had never tried to say a word in this language, nor has ever done since, at least to my recollection. And this uh, is taken from Les Profetes Protestantes, the Impression de, and I can't read the rest, and if you want a copy of the notes, you could get them after, all right? And Jacques Dubois declared that sometimes the people under the inspiration spoke in foreign languages, and this is a direct quote. I have seen many people of one or the other sex, male or female, he's saying, who under the inspiration, they use the word ecstasy. I avoid that word because in today's connotation, it generally refers more to sexual experience, whereas ecstasy uh, is not always a sexual thing. We're pronouncing certain words that the assistants believed to be a foreign language. And afterwards that they were speaking, they explained several times the meaning of those sayings which they had uttered. Wesley, the leader of a great revival today, he operated within the Anglican church, but there was such a great move of God that the Anglican church couldn't handle it. They thought it was fanatical. They thought it was too out of the ordinary. We need to understand something. Jesus said, you cannot put new wine in old wineskins. Let me explain old wineskins. Old wineskins are made of, uh, of skin and uh, hessian as an outer bag. The inner bag is usually a skin. And as wine ferments, old wineskins, unless you keep wetting them in water, the acid starts to eat through and they will burst. And so when you make wine, it ferments and wineskins will burst, especially if they're old. But if the wineskin is made of fresh flesh and it's being maintained, there can be um, 
um, the fermentation that takes place in the process and it will not cause the wineskins to burst. What was Jesus talking about? Was he talking about drinking alcohol? Listen, what Jesus was talking about was this. You cannot take the fresh things of God and put it in an old religious head. I don't want to have an old religious head. Now, I might be older than I was 30 years ago. It's getting harder and harder when I have a birthday to blow out all the candles. I may be a bit older than I used to be, but I don't want to have an old religious head. When it comes to the things of God, I want to be young. I want to be progressive. I want the Holy Spirit to be able to pour, be poured afresh in my body. And sometimes in religiosity, we get stale, we get stayed, we get dead. And we need to keep fanning to flame the fires of the Holy Spirit. Can I get an agreement? Amen. Absolutely. Yeah, give the Lord a clap. Amen. Well, Wesley uh, <clears throat> uh, speaks about uh, <clears throat> the baptism in the Holy Spirit. In fact, he, as uh, they say that over 500,000 Camisards were either martyred or they immigrated from France during this great persecution and many of them went to England. And Wesley, during his revival, accepted these people into the church. But I want you to understand something. That Wesley, when he started as an Anglican minister, initially was a little bit religious himself. He came to America to preach. And history tells us that he had absolute failure everywhere he went. And uh, while he was coming over on the ship, there were these Moravians... More, history tells us that even Moravians were baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues and prophesied. And he met these Moravians and the ship was in the middle of a storm and Wesley was fearful for his life, but these Moravians just kept praising God. He gets to America and he's here for a number of years and has absolute failure and goes back to England broken and defeated and goes to visit some Moravians and some other men of God that were moving in the Holy Ghost. And he has a phenomenal encounter with God and starts to move in the Holy Spirit. And so I want to read to you something that Wesley says. Wesley experienced many extraordinary activities of the Spirit that he considered to be genuine. In the earliest days of the revival of Fatter Lane Society... Wesley records that the revival started with an extraordinary outpouring of the Spirit on the entire congregation. He remembers that it is in that day he repented from unbelief in the manifestations of God's Spirit. Here are his words verbatim. And I'm quoting from Wesley's diary dated June 16, 1739. We met at Fetter Lane to humble ourselves before God. We acknowledged our having grieved him by blaspheming his work among us, imputing it to either nature or the force of imagination or animal spirits or even the delusion of devils. So in other words, when he says we uh, imputed it, we said that the origin of this is demonic. In that hour, we found God with us at the first, from the first moment that they started to repent. Some fell prostrate upon the ground. Others burst out as with one consent into loud praise and thanksgiving. When people start to fall down in the spirit and people start to shout and get excited and emotional, some will call it fanaticism and others will say, we finally got rid of the old wineskin. 
Wesley writes a letter to a deist scholar. As I've been talking to you about revivals and our history here in America, I explained to you what deism is, and deism has to put a rational conclusion on everything to do with God. Everything's got to be logical. Everything's got to fit inside of our brain. If your God is too small, then it's because he fits inside of your brain. I want you to understand that God is bigger than anything we can imagine. Ephesians chapter 3, I think it's verse 20. Paul says God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or imagine. I give praise to a God who's bigger than my imagination. Hallelujah. He's a God of miracles. He's a God of supernatural wonders. Amen. So he writes this letter to Conyers Middleton. And uh, this is Wesley's definitive statement on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he lists various extraordinary gifts that he expects to see revived in any age that manifests the true faith of Christ and love. And this is what he writes. And again, this is taken from a letter to the Reverend Dr. Conyers Middleton. Did I say... Reverend Doctor, you see, deism is creeping into the church today. And if it's not logical, people are disputing it and they don't want any part of it. God never bound himself to the logic of humanity. God has released himself to the power of his supernatural being. Amen. Absolutely. And this is what uh, Wesley, this is history. It's written. These are texts. Uh, he lists the gifts of the Holy Spirit as, number one, casting out devils. Number two, speaking with new tongues. Number three, escaping dangers in which otherwise they must have perished. That's miraculous interventions. Number four, healing the sick. Number five, pros prophecy foretelling things to come, number six, visions, number seven, divine dreams, and number eight, discerning of spirits. All throughout his ministry, Wesley experienced countless healings through prayers. Um, <clears throat> I want to read you one. I've got heaps here. I don't have time for all of this, but I want to read you one. And it's about, and please, I'm not trying to be insensitive here, but today we become very conscious of breast cancer. And uh, it is unfortunately a tragedy that is, happens way too often today in our society. And this is a case of a woman who had breast cancer. And I want you to hear it, uh, what happened. December the 26th, 1761, I made a particular inquiry into the case of Mary Special, a young woman then in Tottenham Court Road. She said, Four years since I found much pain in my breast and afterwards hard lumps. Four months ago, my left breast broke. In other words, the flesh opened up and kept running continually, growing worse and worse. After some time, I was recommended to St. George Hospital. I was let blood. They did bloodletting. They believed that to be a cure and they would drain blood from the body. I was let blood many times and took hemlock twice a day, but it was no better. The pain and the lumps were the same, and both of my breasts were quite hard and black as soot. When yesterday, seven at night, I went to Mr. Owens, where there was a meeting for prayer. Mr. Bell saw me and asked, have you faith to be healed? I said, yes. He prayed for me, and in a moment, all my pain was gone. The next day, I felt a little pain again. I clapped my hands on my breast and cried out, Lord, if thou wilt, you can make me whole. It was gone, and from that hour, I have had no pain, no soreness, no lumps or swelling. Both my breasts were perfectly well and have been ever since. This is taken from Wesley's diary, December the 26th, 1761. During the Welsh revival, which I talked to you about a couple of weeks ago, Evan Roberts was known, and again, it's historically recorded, that he would prophesy and foretell what God would do. 
He would also stand in the congregation and look at a person and God would tell him things about that person. Just like Jesus would with the woman at the well and many other scenarios, he would get what the Bible calls a word of knowledge. And so the Spirit of God was moving all throughout history, irrespective that some preachers, naysayers, want to say that is not the case. We have historical records, books, diaries, and letters that testify to these things. April 9th, 1906, an African-American man named William Seymour went to California. They started to pray for the Holy Spirit. There was an evangelist called Alexander Dowie who had set up a city in Chicago called Zion City. He had untold numbers of miraculous healings taking place. Seymour went to California and on April the 9th, Seymour and seven men were waiting on God on Bonnie Bray Street when suddenly, as though hit by a bolt of lightning, they were knocked from their chairs to the floor. And the other seven men began to speak in tongues and shout out loud, praising God. The news quickly spread and the city was stirred and crowds gathered. And a few days later, Seymour himself received the Holy Spirit's. Services were moved outside to accommodate the crowds who came from everywhere. People fell down under the power of God as they approached. People were baptized in the Holy Spirit and the sick were healed and sinners received salvation. We have a video clip that goes back to 1975-76. It interviews two elderly African-American people, a pastor, a male pastor, and a, a woman, a lovely lady. And they were children during the Azusa Street Revival. They were there in the meetings and they shared their personal exam, uh, testimonies. And uh, I, I really wanted to show it, but I'm running out of time. Uh, this lady was born deaf and could not go to school. And in the Azusa Street Revival, she was totally hear, healed and has perfect hearing and is having a normal conversation with a normal sounding voice. Many times when you have a problem with deafness, it affects the sound of your speech because you don't hear well when you try to speak. Her, she speaks perfect English pronunciation, perfect and totally healed. And here she was now in this video about 70 years old. And uh, uh, the gentleman had been totally healed of tuberculosis. And they testify of the power of God and how people got saved. How people would come and visit from uh, different nationalities. Russian people, Japanese people. Don't forget, you know, this is during uh, the gold, uh, one of the gold rushes and stuff. So there was a very multicultural a conglomeration of nationalities there. And she said people would start to speak in tongues in Japanese and Japanese onlookers who were not born again would hear them praising God in their own language. And, and they testify that these things happened over and over again. I wonder, Pastor Carlos, if at the end of my sermon we can put it on Facebook and so it could be a tag on to my sermon this morning. Can we do that? Yes, and so I encourage you for the sake of uh, saving a little bit of time, go to a Grace and Faith Facebook page or even our YouTube channel, look up Grace and Faith Church Tampa, and you will watch this video clip. It's about six minutes, but it's absolutely amazing to hear the testimony of two people that were alive at that time. Obviously, they're not alive today. Uh, too much time has gone by. But they testify of this amazing revival. 54 years, almost to the very week, the charismatic renewal broke out in California also. 54 years, 
almost to the same week. So Azusa Street took place on April the 9th, 1906. The charismatic revival broke out on April the 3rd, 1960. And this took place five years before the Jesus Movement revival. And the charismatic revival took place uh, on a Sunday, uh, April the 3rd. Dennis J. Bennett, who was the rector or the priest of St. Mark's Episcopal Church, came out and openly told his congregation that he got baptized in the Holy Spirit and started speaking in tongues. Well, the people accepted it, but some of the clergy didn't. And so it created such a ruckus. Number one, it, it, it hit, um, let's see, I believe it was Time Magazine, uh, Newsweek, Time Magazine, and even the encyclopedia started running stories about this. And he was forced to resign his church. But another Episcopalian minister had a church that was about to close its doors. And they gave it to Dennis Bennett. And he went there and he was encouraged to teach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Dennis Bennett claims that over 10,000 people came through that church that was about to close down over the next seven, 10 years, and they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And uh, many of them born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now you might say, well, why is this significant? I've been preaching about revivals. I went to go see a movie the other night, a Christian movie called Show Me the Father. And as I'm sitting in the theater, up come all the trailers for up and coming movies. And I, I nearly fell out of my chair. October the 31st, they're going to start showing a movie called Jesus Music. And it's about how contemporary music started during the Jesus People Revolution and how it has continued today and has become a genre of music that is extremely popular all around the world. So here I am, I preached it last Sunday, and I'm in the theater Friday night, and here's this trailer advertising they've done a complete documentary on the Jesus music that came out of the Jesus Revolution. This morning as I was putting finishing touches to my sermon, this lady interrupts my day by sending me a text uh, and it is uh, uh, Melissa Nord Nordwell uh, on the Elijah prayer list uh, uh, circular or ministry puts out an article on the Jesus movement and she almost verbatim repeats everything I preached last Sunday, and it was dated September the 19th, 2021. Guys, the Holy Spirit is moving. These are things, I can't do this, I didn't do this. Mind you, I often joke that a lot of these national preachers go to my website, listen to my sermons, and then re-preach them. <laughs> but that's not the case. The reality is the Spirit of God is saying the same thing to the church. I've come to the conclusion God wants revival more than we want revival. But the good news is this. When we want revival, we are in agreement with God's Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I said last week I would give you a book for free on the Jesus movement. Do we have our ushers? Would you come? All those that are going to usher. Uh, this is a hardcover book. And uh, I was expecting a paperback book. This is a hardcover. Let me take one of these and just show everybody. And what I would like is one adult from every family. If you would stand, my ushers are going to start giving these out. That's a hardcover book. It's about the history of the Jesus people revival. Guys, I can't orchestrate all this. God is doing this. I didn't put together a movie that's coming out on the 31st of October that's all about the music of the Jesus revolution. Nor could I affect this lady, uh, Melissa Nordwell, to write the article and didn't read like my sermon. 
it was amazing that she was running the parallel of what was happening in society back in the early 60s and how it's so similar to what's happening in the United States today. Listen, these are not coincidences. These are God incidences. God is doing something. And other men and women, no different than me, me no different than them, us no different than you, are hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. Again, when I read that this morning, I thought to myself, if I don't get Barbara to verify the date, people will think that I preached off of her notes. You would think it was identical. But this is the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you to start hungering for more. Hunger for more. There's more of God to be had. There's more of God's power to be had. I thank God that we see miracles on a regular basis here in this church. But I'll be honest with you, I'm not satisfied. I want even more of the Holy Spirit. How many of you feel the same way? Come on. We want even more of the Holy Spirit. There is power in God. There is power in God. And when we get filled with God more and more, people get offended. Oh, I got the Holy Spirit when I got saved. Listen, I got God when I got saved. I got Jesus when I got saved. And I'm not ashamed to say I want more of God and I need more of Jesus in my life and I want more of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So we could take offense and get all uppity and get religious and have all these arguments while I got the Holy Ghost. Or we could say, you know what? If the Holy Spirit can do these things that we've read in history, that we read in the New Testament, and some of the things we see today, then I want more of the Holy Spirit to work in my life. And there's no offense in that. Amen. Would you stand with me? I was going to get uh, Paul to stand up and tell us about his experiences with the Jesus People Movement. He, he had been to numerous conferences. Just throw the, the slide up, one or two slides. He said 30 to 40,000 young people at a time would show up. Show the one with the big crowd. That's it's the same one, but look at that. And, and he said these were happening all the time. Beth uh, spoke about it. Pastor Tom, I asked him during the week, do you remember the Jesus movement? He said, Pastor Rob, I was in college. Everybody was jumping in a bed with everybody. Drugs was everywhere. He said, and almost daily there was riots and bombs going off. He said, everything you described last week brought memory back to me. Listen to me. Why am I preaching this stuff? Why am I preaching this stuff? Because your nation, our nation, needs for the church of Jesus Christ to get back into the Holy Ghost because the only thing that'll change America and the only thing that'll save America is the church of Jesus Christ repenting, getting honest, and calling on the power of God to touch our lives and to touch our communities. The America I'm living in today is not the America that God dreamed about. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. And if America is going to hell in a handbasket socially, it's because the church doesn't have enough salt on her. So I won't apologize for saying I want more of the Holy Spirit. I won't apologize for preaching about revival. I've already shared with you and shown you over the last few weeks how every time America has reached a crisis point in its history, at critical moments in our history where faith in God was almost zero, the Spirit of God would breathe on this nation. What do I want? I want every man and woman around this world 
to have encounters with God through Jesus Christ. I would that the whole world would know our Father and know how wonderful God is. Am I just looking for emotionalism? No. But you can't have an encounter with God and it not affect you mentally and emotionally and spiritually. The prayer for revival and the need to preach such things is because there's a better hope than politics. Somebody say, thank God. There's a hope better than politics. And when the church is looking to the right person in the White House, we've lost the plot. In fact, that alone is a terrible statement about where the church of Jesus Christ is at. Politics aside, we are, we are an extremely divided and volatile nation right now. But this nonsense is happening around the world because demons are moving. When the enemy comes in, God wants to raise up a flood a standard against the enemy. Come on, everybody repeat after me. I'm not going to take offense. You understand, we're living in a time, young people are so confused, they don't know if they're Arthur or Martha. I'm not trying to be derogatory. Our schools are trying to encourage this line of thinking. Oh my God. If that doesn't prick our heart, where's the salt? Are we preserving? Where's the effect of the salt? Is the church having that preserving effect on society? The world has gone mad. America's gone mad. Let's keep politics out of this. Because both sides are wrong somewhere along the line. But if we're going to lay blame anywhere, the church needs to stand up and take accountability. And that's what repentance is about. Being grown up enough that you're not going to get your, hurts, your feelings hurt and you're going to say, you know what, the buck stops with us and the state of America is partly our fault because we want a convenient Christianity. We get angry because church is in 60 minutes. I can't have a decent worship service in less than 60 minutes. Uh, by the way, let me tell you something. One of the marks of every revival is they're in church all day and people don't feel tired. Those, those are historic facts. When my people help me dead, when my people who are called by my name humble themselves, turn from the selfishness, the sinful ways, their idolatry. Anything that stands in the way of your passion for God is an idol from another mother. If my people humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven but he didn't stop there. I will heal their land. Why would I talk about revival? Because revivals bring national healings. Revivals bring national healings. And so to every person in this congregation and everyone who's been following us online, don't be afraid of what's going on. Hear the word of the Lord. Let faith rise up in your backbone. I'm not going to tell you to treat COVID like it doesn't exist. That's foolishness. It is a move of the demonic. It is a serious sickness. And it has taken way too many lives. Where is the church praying on its knees? Where is the church repenting? Where is the church rising up with healing in its wings? Where is the church of Jesus Christ standing up and saying, you know, this is the time for God to show up. 
But we want God to show up when we don't even show up to a prayer meeting. Come on, church. I'm not going to give you milk. I'm going to give you meat. Amen. Because if I only give you milk, we remain babies. But when we start chomping on a bit of meat, we become grown up. Amen. Amen. I thought I was. <laughs> Love you, buddy. I've said a lot of things this morning, and I'm going to close. But Rick, the most important thing is I give people an opportunity to ask Jesus in their heart. There might be people here today, and they've gone to church, but they don't know what it is to be born again. I will not apologize. Whether hands go up or not, I will not apologize for making an altar call every Sunday. So every eye closed. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart, the Bible says that our sins not only mess up our lives and make us miserable, but they put a separation between us and God. And Jesus Christ came to take that separation away. He said, I stand at the door of your heart, of your awareness, of your consciousness. I'm going to reason with you. I'm going to knock on your emotions. I'm going to knock on your logic. I'm going to knock on your conscience. And if anyone responds and lets me in, I will come in to their lives and live with them. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any will respond, I will come in, Jesus said. If you have never asked Jesus in your heart, if you don't know if you're born again, if you'd like to have an encounter with God, put your hand up right now while every eye is closed. Come on, put your hand up and say, I want Jesus. One, two, three. Where else? Thank you. You can put your hands down. Anyone else wants to say yes to Jesus? Three people today are saying yes to Jesus. God bless them. Amen. I want everyone, those of you that raise your hands and everyone in this congregation and those of you who are watching by live stream, God loves you. He's real and he's powerful and he wants to have an encounter with you. Repeat this prayer after me. We're going to very simply acknowledge that we've sinned, we've made mistakes and that Jesus can forgive us and save us from our mistakes. So everyone repeat after me, dear God, I believe you, I need you, I welcome you, Jesus Christ, I don't want religion, I want you, I want relationship, Jesus Christ, come into my heart right now, forgive me of my sins, live inside of me. Thank you, Jesus. I believe, repeat this, I believe that God, you are hearing my prayers. And I'm coming like a simple child. And you said that's all it takes. Jesus Christ, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Take control of my life and live in me and start to lead me and help me grow. And everyone said, amen. amen. You know, at least three people asked Jesus into their heart this morning and probably others online. <laughs> amen. Look, I grew up in the church, but I had to find Jesus for myself. My daddy was a preacher. I had to find Jesus. And I can honestly tell you, I've done stuff in the world, and I've served God. And I can honestly tell you, sincerely, the greatest thing that has ever happened to me is letting God have his way in my life. This is the best relationship I have ever had and am still having. Amen. I welcome you. To a greater relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. 
God bless you. Come on back next Sunday. Next Sunday, I'm going to be preaching on the Holy Spirit. And I believe that God will start to touch people with his Holy Spirit and baptize them. Amen. God bless you. Have an incredible week. Those of you that are staying for the memorial service, thank you so much. God bless to all of you. We'll see you again soon. Dr. Vincent Sinan, one of the foremost authorities who wrote this book, Charismatic Bridges, has something to share with us today. Who and what happened right here at this spot? From 1906, Ralph, until 1909, the Azusa Street Revival took place right on this open lot. It's open now. But one of the greatest revivals in church history because the worldwide Pentecostal movement had its beginning here as a worldwide force. And services went on day and night for three years in this place. And from this place, Spirit-baptized people went all over the world spreading the story of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I think we should introduce immediately our friends because it's a rare honor to have these people here with us. They were there when it happened. And we think of this as the movement that was started without a man. Jesus is the one who brought this movement into existence. Would you introduce these friends? Yes, first this is Miss Maddie Cummings, who was here at the beginning of the Azusa Street meeting as a young girl. And this is the Reverend Lawrence Cantley, who is pastor of a Church of God in Christ in uh, Pasadena, in Pasadena, California. He was here at this great revival, and they are the two only known survivors that I know of who were here at that time. Now, were both of you acquainted at that time? Were you children here in the revival? Yes, we were. You yeah. knew each other? What did you call each other then? Uh, Lawrence. And Maddie. And Maddie. <laughs> yes. You played together. Son, yes. Son Catholic. Son Catholic. And this, Son. Was a, this was a Methodist church. This when, was yes. originally an uh, African Methodist church. And they built a new church on 8th and Town Avenue and rented this to Azusa Mission. And eventually Azusa bought it. Now you were, uh, wasn't it true that uh, both of you received tremendous healings here at this spot? Yes, I received healing. I was deaf. And I, God healed me, and now I can hear. How many years you know, ago? Oh, that's been around 70 years ago now. Somebody said healings don't last. Oh, they do. And sometimes I think I hear too much, but thank God for hearing. <laughs> you mean you really were, were deaf? Deaf, yes. I couldn't go to school. You could not go to go school? school, no. And what about you? Well, I had what we called TB in those days, and tuberculosis, and it was a terrible experience. And I heard that uh, there was a place uptown called Azusa Mission where they prayed for people and they got well. And I asked my mother to bring me and she eventually brought me. And through the laying on of hands and the prayer, God delivered me from that TB. And I have, know I'm delivered because of, not only because of the way I feel, but I have been examined by a lung specialist in World War I, and they said, nothing the matter with you, boy. Get out of here. Would you tell me how old you are? I'm 79 years old. Are last you really? November the 23rd, 1974. Hey, this is quite an exciting day to be alive, isn't it? Uh, Dr. Sign, what would you say this place looked like when the Holy Spirit began to fall? Well, I think these two could tell a lot more than I could because they were here. Well, you researched it, so I thought you might know. <laughs> well, it was just a two-block street. Azusa Street is a very short street uh, near the city hall. It was in the downtown area. And Elder William J. Seymour had come from Texas to hold a revival here in a Nazarene church. But he preached a new experience, the baptism with the Holy Spirit accompanied by speaking with other tongues. Mm -hmm. And a revival broke out in the Asbury home on Bonnie Bray Street. People received this experience and crowds filled the streets. And then they came to find a church building. And they found this old abandoned Methodist church building that had been used as a warehouse, a storage place, and I think a stable at one time too. And they found it was empty. It had no stained glass windows, no pews. They just had rough hewn uh, benches. Mm -hmm. But here, a worldwide revival began and people came from all over the world to this spot to find out what they had. Could you tell us what the main experience was that attracted the people, Maddie? Well, I think first it was because they came and they began to speak in tongues and people heard them speak in their own language. 
the Japanese, Chinese, and all the different nationalities, they heard them speak, and the gospel was preached to them. You mean they had not learned these languages? Oh, no, they had not learned, because the Spirit of God filled them, and they really uh, knew what the people were talking about, and they too were saved. Now, you saw this and heard this with your own ears. I certainly did. Now, Dr. Simon, was this interracial, all different nationalities? The, the great thing, I believe, from studying the history of it was that people from all races and nations and tribes came here. Mm -hmm. Los Angeles yes. was a melting pot city. Right. Yeah. The pastor was a black man, mm -hmm. yes. and mostly blacks to start with, but soon Mexicans and Russians and Chinese and Japanese. And just like today. Just yes. like today. Yes. From all over the world came. And there was no distinction on race, was no, there? No, no. Sure. Nobody. Oh, it, one thing that was so nice, nobody ever said, well, you're black or you're white. But we were just children of God, rejoicing and praising God for all of his love and all of his mercy and his kindness, for his healing. And that was what brought the people. What did they teach here uh, as, a, the, as a doctrine? Well, they taught that you must first be converted and then you must be sanctified. And God would fill you on a sanctified life with his precious Holy Spirit. And you would speak with tongues speak as, as tongue the evidence. Speak in tongues as the evidence, yes. And then other gifts would come like prophecy. Prophecy, healing, and other all the gifts in the Bible. It has Interpretation of tongues. And all, every, every, every gift that's uh, listed in the scripture was practiced right in Azusa Mission. 